success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Hey, this is Bob Bender, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, This week, we have a special guest. I uh, I had an opportunity to read his book uh, a while back. It was uh, actually introduced to me uh, by a former uh, co-worker of mine in the record business. Stephen Witt uh, has written the book, How Music Got Free. And uh, I suggest anybody in the record business or in the music business or or management, uh, read this book. This is this is a great read. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So, I, first of all, I got to tell you, it, what was the incentive on writing this book? You know, I had been a, a serial music pirate back in the day, as I discuss in the book. And at one point in the late 2000s, I was sort of looking over my music collection. We were still in the MP3 era. And I asked myself the question, how did all this material get to my computer? So I started to investigate the answer to that question, thinking I would find, uh, you know, kind of crowdsourcing narrative, you know, all of these people uploading scattershot CD tracks from their basement computers, and was startled to discover that that was not true, and that much of what had happened in the music industry in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s was the result of an organized conspiracy to infiltrate the music industry's supply chain and leak all the music out. And as I sort of stumbled into that narrative and, and got deeper into it, it, be, it became clear to me that there was just an unbelievable story to be told. I, I found it interesting uh, having a record label background myself that even with the tight security that went on in these manufacturing plants, uh, that uh, the two of the, the individuals you mentioned in your book, uh, uh, Benny Glover and Tony Dockery, how they were able to just get material out and and get it online. Uh, is this something that it, it was more, I mean, was it just those guys and a few others? Because you do mention some other individuals in the book. Uh, was this pretty rampant out there on, on getting the product uh uh, out there into, into the, the, the space of, of, of audio. Well, remember the nature of a data leak is that you only need one weak point anywhere along the chain. And then once you get the data out on compact disc, the ones and zeros can be replicated essentially infinitely. So in fact, the record industry had reasonably good security. Um, but at this one plant, there was just a hole, a, a gaping hole that these guys exploited. And it should be said, these guys sort of acted like moles. You know, Glover, uh, the guy who leaked most of the CDs out of the manufacturing facility in North Carolina, uh, wasn't just an employee. At a certain point, he was actually promoted to a sort of oversight managerial position. Almost to a manager position. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that gave him uh, the authority to schedule shifts for the leakers that he knew were skilled at smuggling the CDs out of the plant. And the way they did that was to sort of, well, it's complicated, and I'll I'll get into it in the book. But the the point being, yeah, it was very well organized. And they had online, there was a conspiracy that was recruiting people like this to distribute the material online. Uh, So it it really was the result of kind of an organized attempt to infiltrate uh, the music industry's supply chain in a way that would be better associated typically with an intelligence agency or, or like almost like a mole uh, you know, if you read the kind of some kind of spy novel or something like that, and less like sort of what you would classically think of as hackers or, or kids in their basement. So, so were these guys in intent, uh, and I don't know how deep you would go if you would go all the way to, I guess, the, the RNS ring, ringleader Cali, mm-hmm. were these guys intent on taking down the record business? It was not their immediate goal to cause pain. I don't think so. Sometimes it was, but that was not their overriding goal. Really, they were doing it for the thrills. It was a real kind of uh, thrill-seeking behavior. And let me back up to the listener has a sense of what I'm talking about. This underground online is something called the scene, and it really is an underground. Uh, Probably there's no more than 1,000 or 2,000 people who belong to this scene at any given time. And, And that would be worldwide? Worldwide, yeah. 
Uh, it gets its name from this the 80s, something called the wares scene, and it started out with kind of kids and hackers cracking the copy protection on software. If your listeners are old enough to remember back in the day, you'd sort of have to sometimes get a piece of software and then key in a special serial number from the back of the box or something like that. Uh, these guys had pioneered the techniques to crack that encryption and, and give you a free copy. When the MP3 became available in the 90s, they, they gravitated toward that. And so the entire software piracy movement actually grew out of an, uh, sorry, the music piracy movement actually grew out of an earlier software piracy movement. And so they had the techniques and essentially almost the spy craft, the espionage ability to get deep into the music industry supply chain. And the other way they were like spies is they were just incredibly good at preventing people from knowing that this scene even existed at all. And that's why it really wasn't underground. Uh, I remember Pitchfork, shortly before my book came out, Pitchfork published a history of album leaking. And they went through all of these you know, famous album leaks, and they didn't even know the scene existed. A reporter had spent two or three months compiling all of the leaks he could find, and he didn't even identify the main culprits or know of their existence. So, you know, I don't... Uh, I don't want to say that I blew the lid off the thing, but I was the first journalist to write in any kind of organized way uh, about this very secret uh, underground group that, that really was responsible for probably 80 to 90 percent of all of the music leaks. Uh, when we talk about music leaks, I know that at, at one point, I've shared this in other podcasts before, at, at one point, uh, the record business got out of selling singles. I mean, we were selling uh, cassette singles and CD singles, and we were selling full albums. Uh, and, and then, you know, we had the opportunity to start downloading music. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an industry, we, we didn't know how to do it. We didn't, first of all, okay, so you put it on iTunes. And, uh, but, you know, what's the structure and, and what's the pay? It, it, and there were so many recording contracts uh, from an artist's perspective that uh, it didn't know how to apply itself to a download. Um, I guess the record companies, they really didn't have, they didn't see this as a threat because... What, wait, they didn't see what? They, they didn't see the downloading as, as, or oh, file no. sharing as a threat at all. Uh, no, um, is that true? No, I don't believe that to be true. They had always been very concerned about piracy. Mm -hmm. If you read the stuff they were writing in the late 90s, they are very concerned about piracy, but they were very concerned about CD burning piracy. So they missed the MP3 for the first few years there. Uh, anyone who works a record label uh, has always been concerned about piracy. It's been a, a, a constant problem for the industry going back to the 50s and in the, in the broader world of copyright going back to the 1700s, 1600s. So they were concerned, they just missed the technology. They thought the important technology was the CD burner. They thought they were gonna have another wave of piracy similar to the one that they'd had in the late 70s and early 80s with the introduction of the dual head cassette tape deck, which had also hurt them. Um, and so they were forced into a role of permitting digital downloads, which they didn't want to do. And many people warned, uh, from within the industry warned the other players in the industry that this would ultimately cannibalize album sales. But when the iTunes store launched in 02 or 03, uh, they were essentially forced into this position. They, right. they had to do something right. because they lost control to the pirates. Um, but you're right. Uh, what really ended up hurting, I say this a lot, and I don't, not everyone agrees with me, but I'm, but I'm pretty sure it's true. What really ended up just destroying the music industry, cutting it in half, was not the pirates. It was the decoupling of the single from the album. You know, for years, the industry had been able to earn extraordinary profits off just a one-hit single. So you think of an act like Vanilla Ice, okay, Ice Ice Baby, really the only song anyone's going to ever associate with this guy. Well, they sold, I think, something like 10 million albums. Based Al on albums. albums, yeah, albums at you know more than ten bucks a pop, twelve, thirteen bucks a pop, based on one hit single. Now, if a one hit wonder Ice Ice Baby song comes along today, how much are they going to make? Well, not nearly as much. For their digital downloads, they'll make you know one fourteenth of that, and through streams, they'll even if it gets streamed five hundred, six hundred million times, they're just not going to get anywhere close to the amount of money. And that's not the pirates' fault. You know, music piracy is essentially dead now. It's, it's. I mean, people still do it, but it's, it's not a very. It, it doesn't have the impact. It doesn't the have the impact. Yeah. Almost everyone, including me, now pays to subscribe, uh, but the profits haven't returned. 
This is Bob Ender, and uh, we're in the studio today with Stephen Witt, and you're listening to this edition of Business Side of Music. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Bob Bender, president of Bob Bender Productions. Since 1987, our company has provided consultation and artist direction services for recording industry artists. If you're looking to take your music career to the next level, or simply need advice on jumpstarting a project or marketing one that's been completed, then we're here to assist you with over 40 years of experience in the entertainment business. We offer individual or group sessions, in person, or over the phone or Skype consultations. Feel free to call our office at 661-326-1140 or email us at info at bobbenderproductions.com for more details. You're listening to the business side of music. One of the things I found interesting uh, in the book uh, was, uh, I think it was in uh, chapter nine, when you talk about how the RIAA went after Napster. Uh, and they also, um, you know, the, 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 you said in there, in fact, the music industry w- won the wrong lawsuit. Yes. Uh, Napster lost, but the MP3 file became valid. That's right. Well, essentially what happened is the music industry filed two lawsuits simultaneously. One was against Napster uh, for sort of, you know, illegal uh, distribution of, of material in violation of copyright. And legally, that turned out to be a slam dunk. Uh, they just won at every level of the court, and Napster was driven totally out of business. Uh, now, Napster should have cut a deal, and they didn't for other reasons, but, but they just were destroyed by this. Unfortunately, winning that lawsuit didn't help them at all because the moment that Napster was was put to bed, 30 competitors sprung up in its wake, and some of them, like SoulSeek, believe it or not, even continue to this day. Mm. Um, so peer-to-peer proved impossible to destroy legally. Um, however, they had another lawsuit against Diamond, who was an early manufacturer of an MP3 player. Um, what had happened is that there were all these MP3s online, and there was obviously a lot of money to be made for the per- first uh, company to introduce an MP3 playing gadget that really worked well. But because nobody was certain about the legality of the MP3, none of the major gadget uh, players would invest in it. So Sony wasn't going to invest in it. Uh, Apple was not going to invest in it for a long time, believe it or not, as were you know, none of the major tech companies. So these kind of second or third tier players like Diamond Rio would come out with MP3 players, and they were sort of at the bottom of the gadget value chain. The RIA sued Diamond, saying you can't have an MP3 player. This is a device that, in the, that enables criminality. And that lawsuit lost uh, for the same reason that you can't sue someone who makes bongs, if that makes sense. For the same reason that drugs, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good analogy. Drugs yeah. are illegal, but drug paraphernalia is not illegal. Yeah. It's essentially the same legal legal ruling. Yes, copyrighted, uh, you know, you know, uh, copyright cracked um, music is illegal, but a device that can play MP3s could be used, at least in theory, to play legal MP3s. Because it's, it's a platform. It could be used for a variety of right. things, just even though everyone knows that 99% of the people using this are filling it with, with illegally procured music, it doesn't matter uh, from, in the eyes of the law. Just like when you buy you know, a, a glass water pipe at a head shop, you know, technically it's for tobacco or whatever, but everyone knows you're smoking weed. Um, essentially the same lawsuit, uh, the same legal reasoning applies. So Diamond won that lawsuit. And when Diamond won that lawsuit, that opened a floodgate of investment from the major tech players in a race, really, to be the first uh, to build the real first functioning MP3 player. As we know, that race was won Mm -hmm. by Apple. Uh, And at the time that Apple launched the iPod in 2001, this is extraordinary, but it's true, uh, Apple was 133rd the size of Microsoft. It was considered a second-tier tech player, almost a niche you know, gadget company that, that almost nobody cared about. Uh, by the end of the mobile revolution, which was sparked by the iPod and later continued by the iPhone, Apple was the largest company on earth. So it's sort of accurate in some ways to say that the roots of the mobile revolution are in copyright infringement, in uh, this large scale wave of piracy by an entire generation that placed all these valuable files on people's computers, and then they were looking for a way to get them off. 
I, I think at 1.2, when, when the record labels finally got into uh, putting their music, distributing their music on, on iTunes, um, the, one of the things I know they had to do is they, they had to go back and, and I said earlier, and they have to almost had to go in and renegotiate some deals. And I remember, I, I think it was either RCA or Sony put thousands of songs on iTunes to sell and almost immediately had to pull a good portion of them off because they hadn't contractually cleared them. And so it was a bit of a wake up process. So let's talk a little bit more about wake up process. I think uh, Hollywood, when they released DVDs, uh, if, if my memory serves it correct, they, they encoded those so you couldn't, at that point, at least with the technology that was out there, burn them. But you could take a CD or you could take a cassette and duplicate and replicate uh, on and on and on. Why do you think the music business didn't put in protective devices in, in their music? Because they uh, came out with the technology in 1982, 1981. And when they were you know sort of setting the standards of how uh, a CD would function, the idea of home internet, the idea of a home computer was still pretty far away. And very expensive. And very expensive. Yeah. So I think they, you know, you would have had to see really 15, 16 years into the future, which is impossible right. uh, to, to make that connection. And by the way, the DVD encryption was cracked immediately by the pirates, and there was a huge wave of movie piracy, so it didn't help anyway. For the, the average consumer, though, who didn't, who didn't know about... Uh, uh, music piracy or, or didn't have that understanding it was I guess it was a safeguard in for uh, from that standpoint do you I don't, agree I, or no I don't agree yeah uh, because most people it depends on the age group you were in but if you were a younger person in the early 2000s you pirated movies uh, and a lot of people did and it didn't matter if you personally didn't know how to crack the encryption on a DVD someone out there figured it out and once that file was available it was very easy to procure well, was it pretty easy to go online I oh, mean, yeah. you, you didn't oh. have to dig too deep to find no, these any, people? I mean you had to dig about one inch into the internet to find it in fact in the early days of Google you could just type in the name of a movie and a pirated copy would show up uh, because many of the standards that we now have about what will appear in a Google search and what's in violation of copyright did not yet exist. Is, has that changed? Oh, yeah. Now it's hard. Uh, now Google buries all the illegal copyright infringing links. Uh, there's the DMCA, which allows a copyright holder to tell Google to essentially pull the link off, and they will. Do you think the RIAA did the right thing when they went after these 12-year-old kids in Brooklyn and sued them for... You know, quarter no. million dollars. No, even they know they didn't do yeah. the right thing. Uh, oh, I, I don't. I've never. I've heard. I think even within the music industry, off the record, almost everybody I talked to said this was a terrible idea. We never should have gone after the kids. It hurt us badly. Uh, I think I've heard maybe two people defend it, and one of them was the guy who argued the case. So it was a it was a disaster. Yeah, it, it didn't help them. It was it was obviously bad press, and and it was bad press and accomplished nothing. It didn't stop piracy. In right. Way. And and these people, you know, who were being, you know, sued for a quarter million dollars, they didn't have a quarter million dollars or whatever the amount was. Almost everyone settled. It was a shakedown in some ways. Uh, they would let you off the hook usually for a few grand. Um, I think only two out of the 17,000 plus lawsuits the IRAA filed, filed against sort of average rank and file, file shares, I think only two went to trial. Uh, the most famous one was a woman named Jamie Thomas, who was a single mother of four, who was accused of downloading or uh, downloading and then sharing uh, 24 songs off, off, I believe it was Kazaa, but one of the file sharing services, um, including stuff that clearly was not, it was clearly her kids doing it. It was like a cannibal corpse or something. Uh, you know, it wasn't J Jamie Thomas, mother of four, wasn't listening to that. It was her kids, but, you know, they'd gotten on her computer and done this. And so she decided to fight the case. It went all the way to the appeals court, the Supreme Court denied to hear, uh, declined to hear it, uh, got kicked it back to the appeals court, and finally, in the end, she ended up owing the music industry. I believe it was something on the order of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars wow. for twenty-four songs. A judgment which stands to this day and which bankrupted her. Uh, so, what's interesting about this is that if you get the copyright infringement argument in front of a jury trial, and this isn't the only case, or in front of a jury. They tend to side with the uh, they tend to side with the copyright holders. I mean, the law is pretty clear on this. Right. Um, right. It was just that that was exceedingly difficult to do in the wave of a widespread uh, campaign of copyright infringement. She really became their sacrificial lamb. I have no idea why they targeted why her they specifically. chose her specifically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and meanwhile, these guys like Glover, who were just doing real enormous <laughs> damage. 
were getting off. Most of them, you know, never got caught. This is Bob Bender, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Vinny Rebus, the founder of Vinny Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. Side of music. I want to talk about a, a couple of the principal characters uh, in in this book. Uh, Benny Glover. I mean, this guy. Do you think he was ground zero? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, w- look, someone was going to leak this stuff eventually, sooner or later. But this is the guy who worked at the manufacturing plant. He had access to the CDs literally at his fingertips in the packaging line, um, you know, weeks and sometimes months ahead of their release date. The music industry resembles the movie industry. The the first weekend is the big weekend. Right. Um, you, know, you always had that release date on Tuesday. Release date is huge. And yeah. if it leaks beforehand, there's absolutely no question about it. You don't make as much money. Now, there's a few exceptions. If you really have a great product, it can actually spur people to go buy it. But the, street, the dirty secret of the music industry, and this is true with almost all entertainment industries, is that most of what they put out is not that good. So if you can get a preview copy of it and you hear it and you don't like it, which is what happens 50% of the time or more, uh, you're really going to get hurt. Uh, and so he did an incredible amount of damage leaking out something lo- something like 2,000 albums, uh, all f- mostly from Universal Music Group over the course of six or seven years, including most of the major hits of the era. He le- especially if you like rap or R&B, uh, that's where he really targeted the most, and that's that's the kind of music he liked the most. Um, you know, it was 50 Cent, Kanye West, um, DMX, it was Jay-Z, it was Beyonce, it was Rihanna. He leaked them all. It was Eminem. I mean, he was really the guy. He was really the source. If you found that music online and you were wondering how it got there, this guy was the first to post it. How come he got along with a, away with it for so long? They were hard to find. Like I said before, this underground scene, their spy craft was excellent. I mean, they really ran it like a, like a spy agency. They never talked about it online. All of their chats were encrypted. And so the, both the RIAA and the FBI were looking for these guys for four or five years, and it took them forever to crack the case. They were really quite good at, at what they did. Additionally, at the plant he was leaking from in Kings Mountain, it had become clear to the music industry by maybe even the early 2000s that the compact disc was ultimately going to go away. Right. Uh, and so they had started investing less and less in these plants cutting costs everywhere, including costs for security. So it became actually easier to leak stuff out of the plant, even as it became more damaging. Ultimately, Universal sold the facility and then had sort of an arm's length contract, uh, uh, arm's length transaction that they would still contract it to, to provide their music for them. And so then, you know, maintenance deteriorated. They sold it to a bunch of poor operators who really ran the facility quite poorly. And so it became almost exceptionally easy to leak stuff out of the plant, ironically, even as it was doing more and more damage. So Tony Dockery, where, where did he fit in all that? I mean, he and Benny seemed to be really good friends. Or at yes. Least, yeah. Well, they were. Uh, then they their friendship ended after they were both arrested and put to jail. And as a condition of their parole, they couldn't talk to each couldn't other talk to each because other. they were involved in a criminal conspiracy together. Um, but Dockery was also a line worker at the plant. He made about thirteen dollars an hour uh, packaging compact discs into a shrink wrapper and feeding them in. Meanwhile, at home, this is all in North Carolina. He had been one of the first people to really get into the internet. 
in the 90s, early, mid-90s. He'd been on AOL and CompuServe, f- quickly found the more corporate services to be boring, and then via internet chat, IRC had found his way into this underground of, of file sharers. So he was in a very unusual position, as was Glover, in the sense that he you know, had no college education. He worked in a factory, but he was very tech-savvy. Uh, and he was obsessed with the internet, as as was Glover. These were unusual proclivities for, you know, kind of working class guys from the South whose other hobbies were driving ATVs, you know, shooting guns. and, and Basically blue collar workers. For the real, no, real blue collar. Yeah. I mean, neither of them went to college. Glover's other side business, in addition to leaking CDs, was, was breeding pit bulls. Uh, so they were really, you know, blue collar guys, but they were obsessed with the internet. And I think this is one of the reasons the two of them were able to get away with it for so long. They were beneath suspicion. You know, Dockery was was obese. He was 300 pounds. He, he you know, was a, a, a big Baptist, Catholic, a big Baptist a Christian guy. Uh, you know, not the kind of person you'd necessarily think of as kind of a master hacker. Glover's the same way. Uh, he's black, very muscular, covered with tattoos. You know, kind of had at one point belonged to a motorcycle gang. Uh, even by his own admission, kind of had a, a rough and tumble, not not thuggish upbringing, but you know he was on the border. You know, most people you think of as internet criminals have almost no experience with the actual criminal world. Right. Glover was in both, and that's pretty rare. And so I think that made him hard to catch. Do you ever chat with him? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, you know, he was arrested, went to jail, was out, uh, has completed his probation, and now works at the Freightliner truck manufacturing facility in North Carolina. Um, now his sideline, I don't know if he's still doing this, but for a time, his sideline, okay, so in the book I describe Glover as the guy who, who ruined the music industry to put rims on his car, because uh, he... <laughs> That's true, though, yeah. That's true, yeah. yeah. He's, and, he, and a lot of the people who, this, Glover was also different in this way. A lot of the people who did this, a lot of the people who leaked music either did it for thrill-seeking or for maybe ideological anti-capitalist motives. Um, Glover was not that way. He was motivated by money, uh, and that was very rare in the scene, actually. Most of the people who do this do not care about money, uh, but Glover wanted money. And so what he would do is he would trade his leaks online for leaked movies and leaked DVDs. Then he would burn them in his house and sell them out of the trunk of his car at, at swap meets or in barber shops and stuff. Now, because he was keyed into this underground, he would get the new releases four or five days before any of the other bootleggers could right. do it. And that is worth an enormous amount of money, it turns out. If you are the first guy on your block selling a bootleg DVD of Spider-Man, you can make 10x what the other boot- bootleggers can make. If you ever remember the days of, of Blockbuster and going in and it's almost all new releases and mm-hmm. people complain it's just all new releases, that's all it is. Well, Blockbuster was just responding to the needs of the customer. And all anybody wanted was new releases. So through this DVD bootlegging uh, ring that he essentially ran, he was able to make hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in cash. And that's why he did it. And that's why he was doing the leaks. Uh, and that made him a very uh, distinct figure in the scene. Not, not, no one else was doing anything like this. So he took all that money and he basically just blew it on fancy consumer goods. You know, he took his kids to Disney World. He bought all these ATVs. I think he bought a jet ski. Uh, and he, he, bought, he bought this Lincoln, what kind of truck? I think it's a Ford... Explorer, I can't remember the exact kind of truck. Uh, anyway, this fancy car, and then tricked it out with neon lights, a, a $10,000 stereo system, and, and spinning chrome rims. Uh, except in his case, okay, you remember spinners? Does anyone? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. spinners, these spinning rims. So he thought that that spinners had sort of been played out, so he got a, he bought a kind of rim called a floater. And the way this works is the, the rim's on an independent bearing, so when your car moves, the rim itself appears to stay still. Almost like what they do on Rolls Royce. Right, right, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's this optical yeah. illusion. He, he loved that stuff. They busted him for it. So then he got out, uh, and he got really into sort of fishing and, and hunting. Uh, and so he, he now really wants uh, to buy like a nice fishing boat for himself. So he's out of prison, and he finds this new piracy technology oh, called, no. called, uh, <laughs> called Cody. And what this is, is he buys these commodity computers from China very cheap. Maybe, maybe you can buy, buy 20 of these for 1000 bucks. So $50 computers, wipes Windows operating system off them and installs this open source uh, home theater software onto it. 
Um, and then he sells them for, let's say, 100 bucks around his town. And what they can do is tap you into these illegal streaming pirate sites, like a shadow Netflix out there, except you don't have to pay any money for it. Or you pay like a dollar a month or something. Uh, and so then you basically are undercutting. Uh, you're basically getting a free streaming cable box, but it has everything you'd ever want. And you only got to pay five bucks a month for it or whatever. Right. So he thinks it's legal to do this because he's not the person doing it. It's exactly the vaporizer argument again, the bong argument. He's just selling you an open source theater box, okay? So anyway, he, he's been able to make so much money doing this that he actually bought himself a, a new boat. So he went from being the guy who destroyed the music industry uh, to put rims on his car to the guy who destroyed uh, the streaming services to, to buy a pontoon boat. <laughs> what about... Uh... What about Callie? He was really kind of the, the ringleader, wasn't he? He sure was. Did, did, did you ever actually determine that was truly him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, for legal reasons, I cannot state with 100% certainty that the man who was accused of being, let's back up, Callie was the ringleader of this underground leaking group, uh, which was called Rabid Neurosis, RNS for short. And Glover was not his only leaker. He actually had a, an army of leakers all over the globe that he would recruit through the internet and then give them specific tasks to go out and sort of find music pre-release and, and, and post it. So Glover was his guy inside Universal Music Group, but he also had people inside Sony. Uh, he had people inside Bertelsmann when it existed as an independent entity. Warner, they never quite got, but they were able to get stuff fairly early out of Warner. And then they had people at all the indies. So they had an army of maybe 40 or 50 leakers, all of whom were either music journalists, uh, people who worked in the music industry in one way or another, radio DJs, people with connections that could get pre-release material, and then, of course, Glover and Dockery, who were actually inside their plant. Kali had cultivated and groomed these guys and would actually send them deeper into the music industry, like moles, burrowing for years, and Glover being a perfect example until he was promoted to manager. Um, so really it was, it was like you read about Kim Philby and these kind of like Eldritch Ames, these guys inside the intelligence agencies who leak stuff out. I mean, he was doing that with these guys. He was a real spy master kind of guy. Um, so the other thing that he was exceptionally good at was hiding his own identity online. His screen name was Kali, K-A-L-I, which is the Hindu god of death, but may also have been a, a kind of um, obscure reference to the state of California. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but what the other members of the group were able to learn about his information was that he loved to smoke weed. Uh, he lived somewhere in California with his mom, and he seemed to be either Indian or Pakistani. Uh, he was an American, but of Indian or Pakistani right. ethnicity, South Asian ethnicity. So in 2007, the FBI busts a guy named Adil Kasim, uh, you know, who is half Indian, half Pakistani, smokes a lot of weed, lives in California with his mom. And through some amount of forensic evidence, they're eventually able to f find that his cell phone, he's called Del Glover in North Carolina hundreds of times. Seems pretty likely to be the guy. But then, amazingly enough, if you read my book, he actually is found not guilty. That's right. 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 You want my opinion? It's the right guy. Yeah. But the jury didn't think so, or perhaps they had other opinions, which I talk about a lot in my book and which your listeners will have to read to, to find the full story. But uh, it's probably the right guy. But anyway, he was found not guilty. There's you know, no double jeopardy, so he's, he's never going to answer for that, this. And that's the irony of all this, too. Right. Well, yeah. the irony of all this is they got Glover to roll on him. So Glover was given a reduced sentence to go after the ringleader of the group. He ended up doing, I think, three months in jail or something small for causing, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, tens and maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in economic damage. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And uh, Kali, who was the spy master, had really put it all together, got away with it. I, I know that uh, back in my record label days, uh, we would have distribution meetings, um, and, and we were distributed through WIA. Right. And uh, I remember when, when the digital downloading started happening, taking place, Napster uh, and, and Kazan and I guess Morpheus were, were involved in this. Uh, we talked about it, and right. we said, okay, well, this is taking place. We're not real concerned. And then six months later, we'd have another distribution meeting, and it would be like, well, you know, we're starting to see an impact here. Within about 18 months, we were all going, holy cow, we're in trouble, yep. because it literally was tens of millions of dollars. We were, yep. we, we saw the downward trend in, in sales mm -hmm. uh, of CDs, and of course, you know, once iTunes uh, hit and, and it became legitimized, then 
you know, we went from, I think, 25, 26 national retail stores that would carry music down to about six. And now it's down to about three. Right. And, you know, Walmart, you know, which it, it, for for our business was was about 52, 54 percent of everything we did out of all the 26, 27 retailers. And, you know, Walmart's mindset was, well, you're going to have to sell this cheap. And if you can't sell it cheap, we don't really care. We'll sell wristwatches because right. that's that's kind of how it was. So, yeah, these guys, uh, I mean, the the the. The, the tidal wave that they have created actually really kind of became a tsunami as, you know, the ripple effect was amazing. Well, and, and maybe you might know more about this. I think, though, that downward trajectory would have happened anyway. I, I think eventually it would have, yeah. Because it's, it's such an interesting phenomenon on the Internet. Certain forms of art, for example, television, have been totally empowered by the Internet. Um, it created the possibility of kind of the long form TV serial, uh, 13 episodes in a row to be binge watched over four or five seasons. You couldn't do that before the internet. No. It wouldn't no. work. You'd have to be at home every day on a Thursday at the exact right time. No way. It's not happening. Or you tape the show on VCR and then it doesn't work. I, mean, I remember this era. It was awful. Um, so television actually it created a bonanza of money making. It created a creative explosion and the material improved dramatically. But that's because of the way the format works. It actually works better to watch a whole lot of things in a row. What happened with music is that it, dis, again, it disaggregated the single from the album. So uh, some albums f deserve to be listened to in their entirety, and we know that. But there are many albums that do not deserve to be listened to in their entirety. And in fact, probably the majority of albums do not deserve to be listened to in their entirety. Because they've got one, maybe two, maybe three good songs. Maybe one or two, three, or three. It's especially true of pop albums where there's not necessarily a coherent theme to the album. They've just thrown a bunch of producers and songwriters together in a room and said, okay, let's try and, let's try and throw some hits up here. And they do. They're successful at it. Yeah. But, but that doesn't work so well as an album. So if you can just cherry pick the hits off the album you know, you're not going to make as much money. There's absolutely no way around it. So what really happened is the internet, at least in the world of music, um, forced them into a new paradigm. Uh, and it was a paradigm that was far less profitable. And people always ask me, will it ever return to the, to the 90s era of profitability? And I just don't, I just don't think so. I just don't think it can happen because the truth is for a long, long time, they were over-earning. They were bundling, they're forcing consumers to bundle all these songs together that they didn't necessarily want to pay for, but they had to, had to for the songs they wanted. And I don't think there's any path back to that. Program. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. In fact, we used to release Greatest Hits, Volume 1, Volume 2, on and on and on, partly to, to fulfill record contracts, right? but also because you know that if you didn't put a hit song on a previous Greatest Hits, mm -hmm. you put it on this one, people would go out once again and buy an entire right. CD. Right. Yeah. And that is not, a, that is not a, I mean, you're ripping the consumer off in some ways. I it, don't, I don't, I, no, I, I so absolutely if you, agree. Yeah. If the consumer doesn't want that, if you can, if they can avoid it, they will. The second thing is if you look at Spotify, and I spend tons of time on Spotify and the other services, but especially Spotify, which shows you the number of streams that certain bands or albums get, it's really top heavy uh, for almost everyone. I'm not the Beatles, there's exceptions, but most artists, even artists that we know and love, only really have a couple songs that are really popular. And those two or three songs will contribute 80 to 90% of their total streams. Right. And so if you live in a world where that's accessible to the consumer, all of the rest of that material, and sometimes the album cuts are good or even great, they're even better than the pop hits, but they just don't get subsidized. They don't get paid for. And, and that, that, that's, that creates a crisis for the music industry. And, and, and that's a sad commentary also because, you know, growing up in my era, albums like, you know, Santana, Braxis, or, or uh, uh, Boss Gag, Silk Degrees, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, these were all amazing journeys to right. take the entire album. Mm -hmm. And we're just not getting that anymore. It's, it's, it's just bites. It's just, I actually don't totally agree. I think some good albums, I, look, the album as an artistic statement continues to have power even as it no longer makes sense as a, as a medium. There's no constraints on what you can do. But it seems like people are willing to, okay, I like Kanye West. Yeezus is a great album. Life of Pablo is a great album. It's a coherent statement of an artistic vision mm -hmm. with one unified production sound and it thematically evolves in a certain way. It's a good album. It's not just a good bunch of songs. It's a good album. Same with probably Lemonade, which came out, Beyonce. Uh, Rihanna's Anti, I think, is a great album. Uh, I'm not just talking about the tracks that are hits. Listen to the whole thing. It's a good album. But that's not rewarded financially. 
No. Artists continue to pursue these goals, I think, um, but the, the marketplace doesn't respond to it. And think about those albums you were talking about, Abraxas and, and Dark Side of the Moon, which are both great. Why are they, what, what was the format in which you would listen to those? Well, you could only get them on vinyl. Mm -hmm. You couldn't take them anywhere. And the only way to really enjoy it was to sit down at a record player with either headphones or an expensive pair of speakers, and you were forced, essentially, by the format to listen to the whole thing. So the consumer was forced to consume it, to consume it in this way, and they didn't really have any other options. The introduction of the walk... We actually had to slow down. You had to slow down, yeah. yeah. Uh, you had to slow down. There was no other option. And you couldn't take it anywhere. You couldn't run in the park with your vinyl, right? Right. The introduction of the Walkman and the compact disc uh, brought a new era of listening where you could skip around a little bit. You could go find your hits. You could make your own tape that was all hits. With a CD, you could, you could skip tracks or put it on shuffle or whatnot. And so that removed the constraints that the vinyl album had, had uh, imposed upon both the listener and the artist. And that created a different kind of song craft, one that was more oriented two pop hits. It had to be mm -hmm. to, to meet the evolving demands of the technology, really. Uh, and, and now we live in an era where it's almost all pop hits. People, st artists still want to have albums. I can tell just from talking to them and I can tell from what they put out, but the, the fans don't really respond. Don't know how to or? They just don't have to. Yeah, they don't have to. Well, Stephen Witt, uh, the author of How Music Got Free, it's available. Uh, I actually got my copy on, on Amazon. I guess you can get it at Barnes & Noble. And I just pirate it. Yeah. shit. <laughs> well, we do try to, you know, put, <laughs> put I, I deserve it. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, How Music Got Free, the end of an industry, the turn of the century, and the patient zero of piracy. Stephen, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it. A lot of great information. Thanks so much for having me. This was fun. All right. You're uh, listening to this week's edition of The Business Side of Music. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender for Bob Bender Productions. Co-producer for the show is Vinny Rebus. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.